Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a great presentation ahead. Mike Catone of USA Weightlifting on teaching the full Olympic lifts to your athletes. Um, got to take care of a little business, first of all. Yeah, and of course, the PowerPoint slide does not want to change. Hold on. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It's just tradition. There it goes. Hey, I want to give a shout out to uh, Rob Lasorza of MF Athletic, Everything Track and Field. He is a great guy, great benefactor of the throws, and he can take care of you if you need any track and field equipment whatsoever. He'll give you a great deal. This is us. Our site is called mcthrows.com. We got a website, Twitter, Facebook, on Instagram. It's under uh, my name, uh, Dan McQuaid. I'm a throws coach in the suburbs of Chicago. You're going to hear my voice tonight. You're going to hear Roger Einbecker, also a, a throws coach in the suburbs of Chicago here. And then you'll hear Mike Catone's voice. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, there's a Q&A function that you should see. That you, uh, If you type in your question, we'll get that to Mike. And we're going to have another webinar uh, next Thursday by throws coach Joe Frontier uh, from the Madison Throws Club. Fantastic uh, coach. You may have listened to his podcasts uh, under the Throw Big, Throw Far label. Um, he's got a great club there in Madison, Wisconsin. And again, just a great, he's just a, a credit to the sport. We're going to get him on here next Thursday talking about how to uh, choose a technical model for your throwers. So please come back and join us then. Um, hey, this presentation with Mike has been approved for CEUs by the Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Association. You'll get a 0.75 CEU. Email me, Dan McQuaid, and you've got my email. It was on the, the Zoom uh, uh, registration or invite, whatever you call it. It's on there. So email me because I meant to give you a quiz. And then you send it back to me and I give you a certificate and you send it to them and you'll get your CEUs. Um, our present presenter tonight, Mike Catone, one of the great weightlifting coaches in the world and the perfect guy to talk about this topic, how the Olympic lifts can apply to uh, sports performance because he's got vast experience in these matters. Right now, he's the USA Weightlifting Director of Sports Performance and Coaching Education. He threw the hammer at the University of Arizona. So he knows how to speak about the throws. He also, if you're joining us and you're not necessarily a throws coach, don't worry about that. Mike has uh, worked in sports performance for a long time. He knows uh, ins and outs of many sports. So feel free to submit questions about any sport you're interested in and how this stuff might apply. Uh, Mike managed the weightlifting competition at the 1996 Atlanta Games. He worked in strength and conditioning for the Chicago Bulls under the great Al Ramil. He worked as Gatorade Manager of Sports Intelligence. The last couple of years, he's helped engineer a renaissance for USA Weightlifting. Uh, Mike coached a gold medalist in USA Weightlifting, Tara Knott, in the 2000 Games. But in the, in the last couple of years, he's been part of just a great renaissance in the sport in this country. The 2019 Worlds, United States had their best showing in over 30 years, third in overall medals. At the Junior Worlds, the women's, women were team champions. Um, at the Youth Worlds, both genders were team champions. So things are going great with that sport. Anyway, I could not be more excited to turn you over to the able hands of Mike Catone. Coach Catone, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I'm going to stop share here. We'll see okay. if we can get you on there. The next, the, the next technical hurdle to make sure. <laughs> yes. And success. Success. All right. Hey, and again, participants, just uh, use that Q&A function to uh, submit any questions that you have. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, Dan, I really want to thank you for asking me. Roger, I want to thank you for all your help. Uh, Dan and Roger and I have been friends for many, many years, and uh, they're two of the guys that um, I could not see them or talk to them for a long time. And then I bump into them and it's about two hours later and we've been talking about weightlifting and throwing and uh, just all the stuff that guys like us love to geek out about. So it was a, a pleasure and an honor to be asked to be a part of this tonight. Uh, like Dan said, uh, my name is Mike Catone. I am the Senior Director of Sports Performance and Coaching Ed for USA Weightlifting, the national governing body for the sport of weightlifting in the United States. Um, I've been involved in the sport, yeah, probably 
40 years. I lifted in the uh, Illinois State Championship around 1981. Um, that was my first weightlifting competition. But I really, my first love was the throws. I somehow uh, fell in love with the shot and the discus uh, really very early in high school. I was not a great thrower, but I just uh, was totally enthralled by everything throwing and <clears throat> everything I could get my hands on or seek out to study and learn on the throws um, is, is really what got me into weightlifting uh, as much as it, it did too. And for the first part of my uh, career, I definitely was in weightlifting and throwing together. So love the throws and uh, it's, it's just amazing to be here talking about, uh, talking about weightlifting and throwing together tonight. Gonna tee up uh, for some thoughts on um, just a little bit of uh, the benefits of incorporating Olympic weightlifting movements for throwers. And I think this is important because what do I do for a living? I work for USA Weightlifting and uh, oftentimes I've had people say, well, you're a shill for the sport. So of course you want everybody to do snatches and clean and jerks. But as Dan said, I've been uh, involved in strength and conditioning uh, for most of my career as well. Um, even working for the Chicago Bulls, we had every athlete there on the platform doing some type of snatch, some type of clean. Um, if I wasn't working for USA Weightlifting tomorrow, but I was working with a young man or young woman in pretty much any sport, I would be teaching them some kind of an Olympic lift. So um, it's not just that I love the sport, it's that I really believe and know this works, these movements work for developing athletes. So let's talk about some of this. First of all, enhanced coordination and range of motion. The Soviets back in the day used to call weightlifting gymnastics with the barbell. And if anybody's seen a competitive weightlifter, you notice that, you know, they're, it's a full body movement. It develop, uh, it requires a tremendous amount of coordination, some muscles contracting, others relaxing, you know, within milliseconds of each other. And range of motion, being able to go into full squats, lift comfortably off the floor, hold the barbell over your head with a neutral spine. All these things are developed uh, by training and weightlifting properly. Uh, weightlifting movements improve body composition and work capacity, why? You, because they require a greater amount of mechanical work. The further you have to move a load, the more work is required to do so. Therefore, metabolically, when you do something like a power clean from the floor or two power cleans plus two push presses, it's a tremendous amount of mechanical work. So therefore, that type of work uh, really helps enhance body composition and work capacity, but in a very functional way as opposed to say doing bodybuilding movements, which aren't necessarily applicable to sports performance. We know that weightlifters are some of the fastest athletes in very short sprints, say a 10 or a 20. Hmm, sounds like throwing. Um, <laughs> as far as jumping higher, Dan and Roger both know uh, I, I owned a sports performance business for uh, eight years and I had an electronic jump mat in there, a just jump mat, <clears throat> and weekly, we, uh, we basically did a standing vertical jump on every guy and girl that trained in that facility. And I had several division one females playing jumping sports, volleyball, soccer, track and field. But I only had three women that could do 30 inches plus on counter movement vertical jump. Who were they? My three competitive Olympic weightlifters. So I know that doing these movements and doing them well really have a great carryover to explosiveness. Dynamic stability, we're gonna drain that a little bit more, but if you look at this photo of this young lady on the right here catching this barbell, that's what we're talking about with dynamic stability. It's the ability to catch and receive a force, decelerate that force while protecting your spine, your knees, your shoulders. Weightlifting uh, improves that like really very few other things you can train with. Enhancing core strength, you know, look at this picture of my partner, Piro Stimas over here. Granted, that was in the day, he had a little less body fat, but um, when Piros in this picture was at the height of his weightlifting career, he was doing zero abdominal work. He was at the height of doing a Bulgarian type programming, snatch, clean and jerk, back squat. But there was a article in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning a few years ago 
where they stuck electrodes in all the small muscles we typically call um, stability muscles, you know, your quadratus lumborum, your multifidus, your transverse abdominis, and put people through a whole bunch of classic Swiss ball exercises and dead bugs and that type of thing and looked at how much those muscles turned on, how active they were. And then they measured people lifting barbells off the floor and squatting barbells. And wouldn't you know it, the core activity in those big barbell movements was like double, triple, quadruple what it was on those small muscle groups. So we know that lifting a barbell off the floor with a stable spine, pushing it over your head with a stable spine, definitely enhances core strength. Again, kind of sounds like going through the ring with a neutral spine could really be helpful with that. And then time efficiency, you know, um, I understand from being in the throws that just how technical, um, how much time it requires as a good throws coach to spend with athletes to teach them, you know, how to, how to throw the disc, how to throw the shot, how to throw the javelin, how to throw the hammer. You need time on the field and yet you want your athletes to be powerful and explosive. So you want to pick movements that will help do that, but are very time efficient. We can't necessarily afford to be in the weight room for three or four hours when we only have a small time to practice daily. While we're uh, draining and talking a little bit about benefits and again, why I would believe in using Olympic lifts for any sport I ever train, we need to reference the, these studies here, uh, a lot of them by Dr. Garhammer and Dr. Stone, you see through the years starting as early as 1980 and all the way through 2007, looking at power output of various exercises. And this is power measured with this formula, force times velocity. And um, because Dan's a good friend and I know his sense of humor, I wrote this on here. Hey, remember this formula. We're going to come back and talk about this formula. But power equals force times velocity. So he took um, the three competitive power lifts, the bench, the deadlift, and the back squat, and then compared these to the second pull in the snatch in the, or the clean. We're gonna talk about that again, but if you look at what this young lady is doing here, there is a portion in the Olympic lifts where we bring the barbell from the floor into a part of our body, usually our hips or our upper thigh, where the barbell makes contact with our body. And at that millisecond, we sum the forces, we punch against the ground, we develop this impulse that we put into the bar and we make the bar jump on its own, okay? We basically propel the, the barbell, the heavy barbell up with our legs, okay? So we're looking here at power production at that moment, at that second pull. So now take a look at time, first of all. So doing a bench press, a max effort bench press, anywhere from one to five seconds, a deadlift one to 10 seconds, a back squat one to five seconds. These are fine movements, important movements for throwing. Not saying they're not important, but take a look at time to complete a snatch or a clean, especially that second pull, 100 to 200 milliseconds. Um, I don't think we go into it in, in the slide here, but you take a look at the time when that right foot uh, lands in the back of the ring or the middle of the ring to strike into the shot or the discus, I would bet you it's right about two milliseconds. So what you do here at the second pull is extremely applicable to the final punch into any of your implements. Barbell velocity, look at the bench press, 0.6 meters per second, deadlift and squat about half a meter or 0.5 meters per second, excuse me. Second pull of the snatch and clean, 1.6 meters per second. You're flying, okay? So because you may on the bench, or excuse me, on the deadlift or the squat be lifting more than on the snatch or the clean, so that's true, the force component may be pretty big, but when you add in that bigger velocity, look at the power that comes out. 300 watts for a bench, 1300 watts deadlift and back squat up to 4,000 watts of power generated in the second pull of the snatch or the clean. If I'm a strength and conditioning coach, I'm a throws coach, I know what I'm choosing to teach my lifters. And for the guys, that, you know, when we go throw against the people who aren't doing it, you know, I'm gonna feel confident. I've been training with a lot more powerful movements. Uh, one more quick kind of science background slide here, which I think is very, very helpful. 
And by the way, all these were put together by Dr. Anna Swisher, who is our manager of uh, coaching education and our sports science director for USA Weightlifting too. She was also a thrower and a lifter. She's brilliant. And uh, these scientific slides specifically she put together. And I wanna, gonna thank her again at the end, but I just wanna point that out and give her credit for these slides. So um, again, we come back to looking at the bench, the deadlift and the squat. Um, reading over from left to right here, we see these three movements, they're non-ballistic, right guys? We know when something could take up to 10 seconds, you know, there's something that we're grinding through, we're pushing, it's a strength movement. We're not so much worrying about speed, non-ballistic movements. So those type of lifts, they have a propulsion phase for sure, but importantly, they have a braking phase. You have to stop at the top of a bench unless you're doing some kind of a throw bench press, which, you know, I don't know if I wanna be the guy doing that with my high school throwers and then going to talk to the athletic director when they miss one of the catches. So at the top of a deadlift, there's also a breaking phase. The top of a squat, unless we're jumping off the ground, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, there's a breaking phase. Now these are all three exercises that of course we move heavy loads on, that's great. Let's skip this next line for a second and let's go down to some more traditional explosive or ballistic type movements. So we consider jump squats, we consider medicine ball throws, and we consider plyometrics. So these three type of movements are ballistic exercises for sure. We explode off the floor, right? If we're doing uh, a med ball throw or a shot throw off the toe board with our back to the, to the sector, yeah, we're getting ballistic. We're jumping off the toe board and we and the ball are going up together at the same time. So there's a tremendous propulsion phase. But what's the limiting factor on that? It's light. There's only so heavy of a load you're going to be able to throw over your head on a med ball throw. Same on a jump squat. I mean, at some point, first of all, you're not gonna be able to get off the ground. And second of all, you're not gonna to wanna to jump off the ground with a super heavy bar coming down with an axial load uh, right through your cervical spine down into your lumbar spine. So you're gonna do any kind of jump squats or med ball throws with light loads. Plyometric, similarly, we do these unloaded, you know, on off boxes, jumping over hurdles all very important exercises. All of these are important exercises to have in your training for a thrower. But look, only one line ticks these boxes, being ballistic, the snatch, the clean, the jerk. Propulsion phases only, just like the throw, okay? Um, Coach Venegas, I think it was, used to have people throw snatches into a sand pit. He was just really taking advantage of the mechanics of the, sh the snatch. It's a throw, guys, it's a clean. We use our legs to punch against the floor to make the barbell jump in the air on its own, just like we do with a med ball throw over our head. But the great difference, we could do it with heavier and heavier weights. And what does that mean according to that formula? More power. We have great force plus more resistance, or excuse me, great velocity plus more resistance, more force, we get more power. And snatch and clean on this whole list is the only, only movements that can really help you develop that tremendous power. Okay, <clears throat> so hopefully first, uh, I just wanted to give that background of, of why I would think for anybody, or especially a, a thrower, why incorporating any type of Olympic lifting would be important. Now I wanna give a little bit of background with a few definitions of what we're talking about here. Um, the title of this talk is the full Olympic lifts. And I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with that, but in the sport of weightlifting, we're the only barbell sport in the Olympic games. There's two movements that are contested, the snatch and the clean and jerk. So this is the, the first movement, the snatch. We have uh, one of our Olympians from 2016 here demonstrating the snatch and gentlemen from the Chinese national team also demonstrating the snatch. So we see the bar taken from the floor all the way overhead in one continuous movement. But notice one important thing on both of these lifts, we see that millisecond that I told you about where the bar comes into the center of the body, comes right over the middle of our foot. Therefore, we can use our legs to punch against the earth to propel our body and this bar up for a millisecond. And that's the important, uh, one of the important things we're gonna continue to talk about throughout this whole presentation. So this is called a snatch, right? Um, you see one thing on these lifters is 
they pull the weight as high as they can and they receive it in a fairly low position, not completely in the bottom position. They receive it, they ride down a few more inches and they secure it down in an overhead squat. Similarly, we have the clean where the athlete brings the bar from the floor to their shoulders. Okay, they have to lift the bar cleanly from the floor to their shoulders. That's where the name came from and from old school strongman stuff. Again, though, you see the athlete, this is Kane Wilkes, one of our, our, our best super heavyweight in America. Again, bringing that bar into that middle of his body, brushing off his thighs or his hip, his upper thigh or his hips, and exploding up into his shoulders, actually jumping up on its own for a second, giving the athlete to move explosively under the bar and meet it, okay? Again, he's trying to meet the bar as high as he can and ride down with it. It's just that with a load like this, he's meeting it at a fairly low position. I put the jerk on here. Most of this talk will be honestly about uh, the pulling movements, the snatch and the clean. Um, if you have questions, let's please talk about the jerk and power jerk as well. Um, I do want to show this. Oops, sorry, go for a minute. Show this video of an athlete jerking. Um, for me, as a throws coach, uh, I would always use explosive overhead movements. My daughter was a collegiate javelin thrower. She threw at University of Iowa. Um, I taught her Olympic lifting in high school, and uh, I taught her how to jerk with her left foot split forward. Usually we let the athlete determine that on their own, but since she was a right-handed thrower, I thought it would be cool if she jerked with her left foot forward. Not sure it really had any carryover, but um, the prompt, the principle behind a jerk is the same as the snatch and the clean. We're using our legs to punch against the floor to make the combined center of mass lifter and barbell jump up together for a second. And then as the barbell continues up on its own, we meet it in some type of a lower position. Lifters have found out by splitting their feet wide, it allows them to drop their hips into a little bit of a lower position and by moving their feet wide, it allows them to have stability to hold the barbell over their head. Hence the split that most competitive lifters do to catch a heavy jerk. Hey, Dan, can you guys hear my family talking upstairs? <laughs> no, I'm, tell them to be quiet? Okay. <laughs> I'd like to hear Enzo, though. At some point, I'd like to hear Enzo. <laughs> We're Italian. We talk loud. Even though I'm the only Italian in my house, everyone <laughs> now talks loud because of me. So You're enough Italian for any one house. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay. So we're, we're going through definitions here. We talked about snatch and clean and jerk. So a lot of us in sports performance or in our own programs use a movement or see a movement, snatch or clean, with the word power before it. So we have some examples here. It's Jenny Arthur, 2016 Olympian performing a power snatch. Everything is exactly the same as what you saw Morgan King do in the slide previously, except one thing, and what is it? She doesn't have to ride the bar below parallel. She's able to catch it higher and stop there, okay? The load traditionally on a power snatch compared to a snatch is lighter. It's usually about 87 to 90% of your full snatch. Remember those numbers when we talk later. Most of us are very familiar with the power snatch like this. Power type movements are widely used in sports performance, CrossFit, strength and conditioning. Another uh, little example over here on the right is Jenny doing a power snatch, this time from a hang position at her upper thigh or what we call the power position. I wanted to show that because I wanted to let you know that the term power in front of snatch or clean only applies to how high the athlete meets the bar. They could do a power snatch from the floor like you see on the left, or they can do a power snatch from hang at thigh or hang at knee or from blocks like you would see on the right. So power versus full basically means how high we catch the weight. Here we have a video again, an example of uh, one of the best lifters in America, Maddie Rogers. She was a silver medalist at the World Championships this year, 2019, doing a power clean. Exactly the same as what we saw Kane doing, except for one thing. 
she's able to make the bar jump higher and so she can catch it at a higher point, okay? Automatically, when you know you're able to make a bar jump higher, what does it usually tell you? It has to be a lighter load than a weight that you have to ride down in. So that's why in a competition, you see athletes catching and riding weights down lower, okay? But the effort to do the power clean versus the clean, the pull technique, it's the same. We do the exact same thing. And that's really important to note. Over here, I also put a video of Donovan Ford, a uh, former uh, Olympic training center athlete, should have turned the volume down on that, doing a power jerk. Many of you might be familiar with that from strength and conditioning. There are a few lifters at the world level that jerk this way in competition versus split jerking. Um, one of the things you can see one, that especially when you watch the athlete from the side. Why might we give this the name power jerk versus a jerk? Well, analogously, we're not dropping as low to meet the bar. Therefore, it typically connotes we're not able to lift as much in a power jerk, right? If a weight's heavier, we can't drive it as high. We have to figure out a way to negotiate it and meet it a little bit lower. We open our feet so our feet can go a little bit wider. So power snatch versus snatch power clean versus full clean, and power jerk versus jerk. It's important that we understand nomenclature, what we're talking about as we use these terms going forward. Hey, hey Mike, you got a yep. couple of uh, lifters here. Maddie, I don't recognize the girl on the right. You had uh, Abby and Amy in that uh, slide in your, with you in a picture in the introduction. Yeah. yeah. What... what uh, what, if anything, uh, do coaches need to be concerned about for ages to start lifting and maybe more specifically female lifters? Yeah, that's a great question, Raj. I mean, um, Piros Dima started lifting when he was seven years old. Um, and if you guys could see me, though, I'm making air quotes around my, my when I say lifting because if you really sit down and talk to him about it, um, Yes, he was being groomed to compete in the sport of weightlifting, but weightlifting was being uh, approached as a general form of, of physical preparation. So he lifted on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, three days a week. It was all super technical. They just were learning snatch and clean and jerk. He said once every month, they were able to put one kilo on each side of the bar. So they stayed at the same weight for one month, even if it was easy. Um, and then on the other days, they went and they ran and they jumped hurdles and they swam and he said they wrestled a lot and they jumped stadium stairs. So the weightlifting, you know, he started at seven years old. The man trained straight through for 27 years. In America, we don't necessarily have the type of sports system that identifies a kid young as you're a weightlifter, you're a, you know, you're a this, you're a that, like the system he grew up in. Um, however, we have some of the best lifters in our country, uh, our two best men, C.J. Cummings and Harrison. C.J. started, I think, around 10 or 11, and Harrison started at around 10 or 11 as well. Um, concurrently to that, Harrison had, had been doing gymnastics and still did it for a little while in the beginning of his weightlifting career. So, you know, I think remember that term I used, what the Russian said, weightlifting is like gymnastics with the barbell. So I think you could begin to definitely teach our teaching progressions that um, we talk about in our level one course to a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old. Um, you would be doing that with a PVC pipe, with a five-pound bar. You would be progressing at an extremely slow level. You would keep it fun, and you would be working on technique. But, I mean, you know, we let seven-year-old kids – put on football helmets. We let seven-year-old girls jump off of balance beams and stand up on top of uh, pyramids, you know, in cheerleading class. And so, you know, lifting a barbell, as long as it's done in a technical fashion uh, with an eye on proper movement and in a safe environment, could just be a really good part of the general physical development of a young athlete. You know, am I saying start seven-year-olds? No. Um, Abby and Amy started... Abby or Amy was nine, I think, and uh, Abby was a little bit older, ten or eleven, I think. But um, you know, both still training. Amy's 
doing a hundred kilos clean and jerk right now, you know, um, as about a, a 62 kilo 17 year old. So, but she's still running high school track and, you know, I encourage her to do that. I don't want her to quit doing track. So I think, um, you know, up to a certain level, weightlifting goes great hand in hand. You know, that's the cool thing about it. It could be your sports performance at the same time. It could be a sport for you. Good, Raj? Good, thank you. Okay, no worries. Hopefully, hopefully I answered that well. I think, you know, everything with a kid, and I don't care if it's football, swimming, baseball, you're, you're teaching the technique uh, of, of the sport, of the movement. And that's how weightlifting should be, and even weight training. The problem we have is weightlifting, weight training, you know, it's built around progressive resistance. So we get carried away sometimes like, hey, let's start putting weight on the bar. But, you know, the Russians used to say that the beginning, in the beginning years of doing weightlifting, the improvement comes from neuromuscular stimulation and neuromuscular efficiency, thus learning how to do the movements better and better, not by cross-sectional development of a muscle or adding load onto the bar. So focus on technique. Okay, uh, we're gonna look at some cool videos here for a second. So I started down talking about power versus full. The, the, what Dan wanted me to talk about today really would be teaching these full Olympic lifts, a full snatch or full clean and jerk to your athletes and why you would wanna do it. So I wanna keep going down the, the rabbit hole a little bit of helping folks understand the whys. So for this, I'm just going to switch for one second, if you'll be patient with me, to good old YouTube. And I want to show you uh, two YouTube videos. These are just a minute. I'm going to talk through them. Um, they play in regular speed, and then they play in full speed. I'm going to show Rebecca Kohar here first. It's a full speed snatch, okay? You notice she catches the bar and clearly she rides down to a below parallel position. But watch, and watch her clean and jerk. Sorry, she does both there. Again, catches it, rides down to a below parallel position. She's gonna jerk here for us too. But I want the key on what's gonna happen next here on this slow motion video. So watch the athlete. She touches her thighs, she pulls the bar, is absolutely, or puts as much force, I should say, into the bar, catches it as high as she can, and rides below parallel. Did you guys notice that? She wasn't sitting in the hole waiting for the bar to crash on her. She didn't change how she interacted with the bar. It's just that the load got heavier and she couldn't make it jump as high. So she had to lower her body a bit more to meet it. And you saw the same thing on that clean. She literally had her elbows turned over at about parallel. Just that this is, you know, well over her body weight, almost so double her body weight as a 17-year-old. So pushed her down into a deep squat position. Let's watch the strongest man in the world right now, Lasha Talhadze. Um, he looks to be the first man to snatch 500 pounds. He's uh, coming up on it pretty quickly. Um, he's ridiculously strong. He's six foot six. I mean, uh, I know that you guys uh, at some of your Division One universities or D2 or D3 universities have guys built like him that move like him. And I hope when their throwing careers are over, you'll send them to me. Um, six foot six man. But let's watch this. This is a world record. Or not wasn't a world record, excuse me, but it's at the World Championships. 247 kilos. Look at the pull, okay? Now, if he was doing a power clean, he would pull that bar the exact same way. Exact same way. Fact, merely because he's going into a lower position, he would be stupid to try to put less force on the bar and go under it faster because it's going to crash on him, okay? Watch in slow motion here. It's really important. I want you to watch his hips. Watch right around the white weightlifting belt there. Look at the height at which this man meets this, this load. Up, okay, for a millisecond, and then boom. Okay, he catches it again around parallel and rides down with it. So we need to understand there's a very subtle difference between a power snatch and a clean or a power snatch and a snatch. The pull is the same. The technique is the same. 
The only difference is the load requires the lifter to catch and ride at a little bit lower position, okay? So we need to have that in our minds as I sit here and tell you why I think it's good for a thrower to learn how to do a full movement versus just stopping in the power position. So Mike, what you're saying is a full clean is essentially the same as a power clean, but we have to be ready to ride the weight down under control Correct. to receive the weight safely. A hundred percent. One of the things that Mike Bergner says that I stole from him that I like, that a power snatch is a snatch, a power clean is a snatch, or a power clean is a clean. You miss a power snatch by snatching it. <laughs> you miss a power clean by cleaning it. Just means that at some point, the weight has got so heavy, you can't get it quite high enough to catch and stop above parallel. But everything else is equal, the same. So the trick for a, a coach who has, who has been having their athlete do power clean or power snatch is to transition them then to Absolutely. being able to, to take and, the And to the understand weight. why, Dan, and to, right. and to kind of understand why. We're, we're going to keep digging into that here. Okay, next slide. So just like Dan was saying, just like teed me up on that question. That was great, Dan. You teed up. Anytime. Regardless of catch height or starting position, the movement of a power snatch is the same as a snatch. The movement of a power clean is the same as a clean. Okay, what you see here, CJ Cummings doing in these, in this, uh, these step-by-step um, -step pictures, what you see here Jenny doing in this hang power clean would be the exact same positions you would see them doing if they were doing a heavier weight and having to ride below parallel to catch the weight or, or you know, be at parallel or below to catch it and as they're riding down because it's heavier and pushing them down a little bit. The pole is exactly the same. And remember, it's this magic pole, this magic explosion here that did all those super cool things we saw on those earlier slides from Anna. This pull, this explosion phase. Hey, Mike, quick question. Yep. So these great weightlifters, when they first started, were they doing power cleans and power snatches and then transitioned into full, the full movement? I would say very likely in our uh, USAW uh, teaching progressions that uh, we teach in the level one course, we teach the power, the power movements first. Um, they require, you know, uh, well, one of the reasons we do that is because we want the athletes to understand how to make the bar go up, mm -hmm. punch it up. So we teach the power snatch and the power clean first, and then we teach transition exercises to move into the full snatch and the full clean. And actually, I'm going to show you guys those movements tonight um, to help you transition your athletes into catching full snatches and full cleans. But most – I. I teach young lifters uh, powers first. Um, at the same time, they're learning powers. They're doing other special exercises that will make them good at catching the weight and riding down with it, but tend to do the powers first. So, so if a coach has been having their athletes do power clean or power snatch, they've done already a lot of the work involved really? in getting them to do the full lift. Absolutely, Dan. That's the assumption that you and I are kind of making, in fact, coming into this lecture, um, and thanks for pointing that out, I probably should have said that, that you know, you're, you're probably using the power snatch or the power clean, and that being the case, if you're doing that, you're halfway down the road. Let's talk about why being good at uh, doing a full snatch or a full clean is beneficial to your thrower. Good stuff. Okay. So as I said, again, regardless of catch height, the movement is the same. So I just want to talk through a few points here. I know there's a lot of verbiage on this slide, but there's some really good, uh, important things to talk about and understand here because still a lot of strength coaches, throws coaches say to me, like, you know, why would I teach a kid who's playing football to do a full snatch? Why would I teach a kid who's a shot putter to do a full snatch? So we gotta, I wanna talk about some of the reasoning behind it here. So remember that as a weight gets heavier, 
we have to generate more force against the ground to make it jump high enough to catch. Okay, makes sense, right? Body at rest wants to stay at rest till it's acted on by a greater force. When that barbell gets to our thighs, our hips, we're making a huge force against the ground to make the barbell go up against its will, okay? The heavier it is, the more force we have to generate against the ground to make it go high enough to catch, okay? More force equals greater power production. Again, remember that equation. Force time velocity equals power, okay? We're trying to do a snatch or a clean as fast as we can, always, but as we add more weight, more force is required. So the power equation goes up. Third point, when we're training an athlete, obviously training in the weight room is about progressive resistance. Now, Raj asked me about training a young athlete. Okay, it's not so much about progressive resistance with a young athlete, but assuming on this call, we have a lot of people coaching high school athletes and above, okay? Obviously we're trying to make them stronger. It's about when we get in the weight room, we're always teaching good technique, but we want them to be able to lift more and more and more, progressive resistance, okay? So training is about progressive resistance, adapting to a heavy loads, heavier and heavier loads. So theoretically, in something like a clean or a snatch, a power clean or a power snatch, theoretically, weight on the barbell is going to continuously go higher, right? I mean... Uh, Dan, your best seniors, what's, what's the most a kid is, has cleaned in your weight room, a thrower? Um, 100 and, 150. I think, we had, I think Pat Long did 150. 150, 330 pounds, 150 kilos. And Roger, I know Brett was over 140 with me once or twice, and I, I know he was well over 300 pounds, right? Yeah, I had a couple kids at 150 also. So, I mean, these are high school kids. They didn't start that heavy when they were freshmen, but, you know, these are kids who threw very far. And the more you can clean, the more you can snatch. As long as you have a good throws coach, like, like you guys listening to this, you're also developing the concomitant throws technique. You're going to throw farther. So weight on the barbell is going to get heavier and heavier. If you can move a heavier barbell, with enough force to get it high enough to catch, even if the catch is lower than parallel, you're producing more power. Drop the mic, okay? That's why I think it's a good, that is the, the crux of this talk. Why learning to do a full snatch or a full clean is beneficial, because it helps your athlete move more weight ultimately in a very objective fashion. We know they caught it, boom. They're getting more powerful, okay? As long as you're stressing to them the pull, the power production, the upward force, the intention to make the object jump as high as possible is always 100% there, even if we're catching it and riding it below parallel. The intention is to stand on the tow board and throw the shot over your head as far as possible, regardless of the depth of the catch, okay? but if you're able to catch it lower and you're trying to pull, make it jump as high as possible, you're producing more force. And power production is the name of the game. One thing that comes up a lot here, so when we're talking about a snatch or a clean or even a power snatch or a power clean, we're obviously talking about catching a weight, turning it over into what we call a catch position here we see an athlete in a snatch catch position, so extended arms, barbell locked over her ears, and of course in the clean, barbell sitting above your clavicles on the you know nice meaty part of your anterior shoulders. These are the catch positions for the snatch or the clean. A lot of people have said to me or propo been proponents in the past of not turning the barbell over in a snatch or clean when it comes to the sports performance or throwing setting. Um, and I'm here to, to kind of argue a little bit about why I think it's a good idea to turn the barbell over. This goes together with teaching a full snatch or a full clean. Okay, first of all, turning that bar over shows the ability of an athlete to receive a load. If an athlete's playing a contact sport, 
Okay, take out of throwing for a second, just in the strength and conditioning. Some of you are also strength and conditioning coaches. It's a no-brainer why you would want to be able to catch a snatch or a clean. And I'm not just talking football. Look at the hits that you know young ladies take on a soccer field or a lacrosse field. And by the way, most team sports are contact sports. If a young lady or a young man jumps way in the air to spike a volleyball, when they hit the floor, that's contact, guys. Okay, they're coming down with more than the force of their body weight. It's been accelerated by gravity. They land with one and a half, two times their body weight from what they jumped up with, okay? So most stick and ball sports are contact sports. Coach Ramil uh, termed this, uh, or coin this term triple flexion, okay? When we punch the barbell in the air off of our, our thighs or our hips, we extend simultaneously and aggressively, you know, with full aggressive forceful intention, our knees, our hips, and our ankles all together. That's called triple extension. We do that when we jump off of, uh, jump out of starting blocks as a sprinter, you know, jump off the line as a football player, explode out of the middle of the ring with a shot or a discus or a hammer. Everything in sport activity is about triple extension. Well, catching a bar is about triple flexion, okay? Because now we under load, flex the ankle, knee, and hip. That's very useful for injury prevention. And I was thinking about this because again, people may say, well, I mean, we're in a seven foot ring, you know, or we're on a javelin runway. Um, we're, we're not running around on a field. We're not getting hit by other people. But I think as a throws coach, somebody who's worked especially with young throwers, we all know about those kids who aren't strong enough to hold positions moving through the ring. If you lose the proper neutral position moving through the ring, whether it's gliding or, or spinning, you know, in shot or, of course, spinning in the disc, you know, you're tumbling over, let's say, in your, in your core pillar what's gonna to happen to your delivery? It's not gonna be possible for you to lead with your hip, you know, to get into a good power position. So the ability to turn over a load and catch it in a snatch or a clean is very applicable to that good eccentric strength that's required coming through the ring. When you leap out of the back of the circle, okay, I know you're not getting three feet in the air, but you're getting airborne and you're holding a load in against your neck, 12 pound load for a freshman, sophomore kid, boy, you know, that's uh, a big load. And now they're landing with their body weight plus that ball. We want that eccentric breaking ability so we can hold positions to get into the right position to deliver the ball. Okay. Also catching the bar really helps uh, develop rhythm and timing and balance. Hmm. Sounds also like something I see in throwing. You know, I always used to get pissed off when I was a thrower and a throws coach, you know, when they would say like the fat man's relay, you know, and give the kids, you know, a watermelon to run with or make fun of throwers. Cause I'm always like, Hey, the throwers to me are some of the best athletes, if not the best athletes out there. And it's because of this, the rhythm, the timing, the balance. Okay. That's balletic throwing far is a beautiful thing. Just like doing a heavy snatch or clean and jerk is they're very, very similar kinesthetically. So since we're always want time efficiency, why wouldn't we use movements in the weight room that help develop this rhythm, this timing, this balance, because it's going to transition well out onto the field, okay? And field greater than track. Don't forget, I'm not kidding. Um, so that dynamic stability I talked about. And then objectivity. This is a big, big thing for me. Um, I have in my career as a strength and conditioning coach and as a weightlifting coach, uh, try to, to the best of my ability, let objectivity guide me, okay? Of course, we always have to make some opinions, some thoughts, you know, some subjective things. But in the weight room, we tend to be run by, ruled by numbers, okay? So how do I know if somebody makes a clean or makes a snatch? I know when they turn it over and show me they can catch it and control it. Now I can mark on their paper, hey, Brett just got a new personal record clean, okay? Not that he pulled it to his nipples or not that he pulled it to his belt or not that he pulled it to a string. That's not objective. They're lowering their hips. They're just kind of bouncing it off their body. When you turn it over and catch it, hey, I know I'm doing my job. The athlete has improved because from freshman to sophomore year or midway sophomore year to end the sophomore year, this weight, this number has increased. 
I know that's one check mark I can put on the adjective box, you know, for developing this thrower. So I really am a proponent, turn the bar over, okay? So that goes really importantly into this conversation of moving towards being able to do full Olympic lifts. We talked about the fact that we wanna turn the bar over. We talked about the fact that we always have the same intention to pull, make the bar jump as high as we can. We just can't always make it jump to the height where we can catch it above parallel, okay? Thus, we want to teach the full Olympic lifts to our, our athletes. So, hey Mike, real quick. Yeah. Um, so even really good lifters, they sometimes do pulls without the receiving phase, right? Absolutely. Pulls are great for sports performance. I would, if I had the time, I would, I would put pulls into the training of my shot putter or discus thrower. For sure, they're very useful. But... I'll, I'll say it right now. I'm going to stand on this rock. They're not a replacement for Olympic lifting. They're not a replacement for turning the bar over. And I'll argue that with anybody. They're more so, of a supplement to that. Supplement. They're a supplement. Now, you got somebody with a broken wrist. You got somebody that, you know, has some kind of an issue. Okay. We're not talking apples to apples there. We're talking about special cases. But without turning the bar over, Okay, if you got to understand the proper biomechanics of the weight, you lose that ballistic moment, that ballistic second where you transfer your force that you made against the ground into the bar so that it impulses up on its own for a millisecond, just like you do when you throw the shot backwards over your head. Oh, just like you do when you come out of the back of the ring and punch up into the shot. Okay, why do we reverse in the shot in the discus? Dan. <laughs> we reverse as a result of uh, applying so much force down into the ground with our toes Ooh. that it just kind of carries us into Boom. the reverse. And we need, it to, we need it to save the throw. Okay. Boom. Olympic weightlifting done properly is exactly the same. That's why we see a weightlifter's feet leave the platform. It's exactly the same as throwing, guys. It's just uh, we have the ability to do it with heavier weights to build more and more power to apply to the shot in the discus and the hammer. Don't forget the hammer. I always, I should <laughs> say, I should say hammer first. It's the greatest throwing event. Let's just face it. It's a beautiful event. Okay. So I hopefully have you convinced of why you may want to incorporate these full Olympic lifts into your training with your throwers. Okay. I hope I do have you convinced. But it's not so easy to just say, okay, start doing full snatches and full cleans. In fact, it would be unethical of me to not show these two exercises or drills first. These are the precursors to doing full snatch or full clean. Start over here on the left and watch Maddie do, let me pause this for a second, it's a little distracting, sorry. Start over here on the left and watch Maddie do an overhead squat. If I am going to use the power snatch in training for a thrower or for any athlete. Um, and I do believe it's a very safe and wonderful movement for developing an athlete, particularly an overhead athlete, like a volleyball player, um, but awesome for throwers. Uh, to me, the snatch and the discus go hand in hand. Um, but if I decide that I'm going to really treat this as a progressive overload exercise, thus, my athletes may get to a weight that they can't pull high enough to stay above parallel at some point. So I may want to teach them the full snatch. It's incumbent upon me first to make sure they can do this movement on the left safely, properly, and with some decent loads. Okay, so we use overhead squats with PVC pipes, for instance, in warm ups for many, many athletes. That's awesome, you know, but if I feel that I'm going to transition or I want to prepare athletes, a thrower, to do a heavier snatch where they may catch it lower or ride below parallel, I want to start to load up to some extent this overhead squat. I don't want them to struggle and be holding it in front of their forehead, you know, with bent elbows and, you know, every, all the load on their front of their shoulders like they're bench pressing. You know, I want it locked behind their ears. I want their shoulder blades touching. I want them pushing up in the air as strong and controlled as possible. 
And I would love to see them be able to get below parallel, just like they can. I would love to see any thrower be able to front squat or back squat below parallel because it connotes better functional ability to me. Okay, so um, if I if you're watching this and you're saying, "Hey, Gatone talked me into using <laughs> full snatches," and you don't first test your athlete and do some heavier overhead squats to prepare them, uh, also please say that uh, I was the one who warned you, make sure you do them both together, <laughs> okay? The other thing, the other precursor, full Olympic cleans would be able to front squat. And I mean front squat well, like CJ is demonstrating here. He's got pretty much all of his fingers behind the bar. Maybe his little finger is, has snuck out a little bit, but notice he's got his heels flat, He's got his torso vertical. He's got his elbows very high. As he descends, his elbows don't drop and touch his knees. In fact, as he descends, he lifts his elbows. So we talked about squatting and core strength. My goodness. Front squat, to me, I really think is a more athletic movement. And Dan, uh, you train, you know, we talked a lot about training. Um, front squat's my first bilateral squat for all athletes. I don't care if they're going to be a weightlifter or not. I front squat them first. It's not axial loading their spine. It's preparing their, their torso and their core more aggressively. And it gives me that power later on to go ahead and go into full cleans should I choose to. Both of these are your precursor to transitioning from power snatch or power clean into a full snatch or full clean. If your athletes can't do this and you want them to, there's an awful lot of material out there. Um, at the end, I'm gonna talk about the USAW level one course. Um, I really recommend it. Uh, we talk about how to improve ability of doing overhead squats and front squats. You get access to a lot of material that can help you on that. But there's a lot of material out there about mobility that can help your athletes do these movements better. Hey, Mike, real quick. Yep. So, so an athlete comes, comes into your program. You're a throws coach. Athlete comes into your program and you know you want to teach them how to clean and or snatch. Should you start right away also integrating front squats or, and or overhead squats in their workout as you're teaching them the basics of the, like the pull? Yeah, I, I believe you should, Dan, of course, because um, even if they're not going to go below parallel, let's say your intention is to just stay on power snatches or power cleans. The overhead squat, for example, really does a tremendous amount of development in the posterior shoulder of the thrower and the anterior shoulder of the thrower takes a big beating, right? I mean, uh, the shot, the discus, the javelin, most, a lot of javelin throwers wind up with, with shoulder um, issues later on in their life, maybe even surgery. So the overhead squat can help prepare your shoulders for that, uh, that stress you're going to get in the front of your shoulders because you're locked in and pushing with the back of your shoulders, the posterior part of your upper back. So it really helps develop breaks for the front. And, um, you know, the four years, or almost four years I worked for the Chicago Bulls, every athlete that we uh, brought in for draft testing, Elton Brand, Tyson Chandler, you know, Lamar Odom, big name athletes, we tested their overhead squat and their front squat, not to see how much they could do, but to see, could they rack a bar and could they front squat with it? Could they hold a bar or a stick over their head and overhead squat with it? Why? Coach Vermeil knew we were going to do power snatches and power cleans. And we looked at that as a measurement of trainability. If they couldn't do these movements well, we just knew we were going to have a little more of an uphill battle training these people for sport. So I would recommend if I had freshmen coming in, um, eighth graders even better, I would be doing overhead squats and front squats because it's going to prepare them for later when they're putting more and more weight over their head in the snatch or more weight on their shoulders in the clean. So they're good for you. Those, both those lifts are good for you no matter what. And you get the double benefit that they'll prepare you to do the full Absolutely. movement later on. One thousand percent. Dan, I, I, I mean, you have talked about it forever. I think the front squat may be better for high school kids than the back squat. I, I can't say maybe that that that's that's wimpish. I think the front squat <laughs> is probably better for high school kids than the back squat. 
because look at all the development it does in the upper back and in the core. And at the same time, you're not axial loading the spine. So, I mean, it doesn't matter the sport. If this kid on the right is a football player, my God, is that going to prepare him to take a, take somebody hitting him in, in front of his body, you know? And then as far as the overhead squat, you think about what the, the posture of today's high school kids, how horrible it is, how, um, you know, kyphotic they are, how their shoulders are rolled forward all the time. You can't yeah. do that with an overhead squat. So the overhead squat can really be a magic bullet to help get, people out of that posture i i i do overhead squats though one time a week and every time i do my shoulders behind kill me and i people my people are like shut up mike you say it every time but i always go this is maybe one of the one exercise if you could maintain through the day they put you in the grave you might really be a more healthy person because it really helps maintain your posture so yes whether you're going to do full snatch and full clean or not I would recommend this for my beginning throwers. These would be probably along with some kind of single leg progression, my first two squats. So you would not have them do a back squat max on day one? <laughs> uh, not if I don't want to be the guy that um, the athletic trainer at the school thinks is a knucklehead and hurts everybody <laughs> in the weight room. Okay. You know, I – there's already a lot of people in sports medicine who think strength coaches and weightlifting coaches are, you know, barbarians. I don't want to throw fuel on that fire. I think people that, you know, are good strength coaches, good throws coaches are some of the smartest people in the world. And they would understand the difference between a functional movement like this that prepares the body, you know, done in a good, smooth, functional way versus loading somebody in a heavy back squat and doing a quarter squat on day one, so. Okay, and then the second progression, again, let me, uh, assuming you have, you are incorporating, let's go snatch for a second. Assuming you're incorporating your overhead squats, you have a feel that athletes can handle a decent amount of weight. And I'm not saying they have to overhead squat, you know, a hundred pounds more than they, you think they can snatch, but I would want to keep those concomitant and for several reps. So let's say you think somebody's snatching 50 kilos, 110 pounds. They ought to be able to do overhead squats for threes or fives with that. Make sense? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, you feel good, they're comfortable, they're good at doing that, then, pause over here again for a minute, your next progression is to insert this lift. You do a power snatch, you catch, and you go into an overhead squat without a stop, okay? We call it a power snatch to overhead squat. This gets the athlete understanding the pull's the same, the foot position's the same, the power's the same. Just that I catch, I stabilize, and I go into the squat without stopping. It's a tremendous way to get athletes moving towards doing a full snatch versus a power snatch. If this was all you did, okay, in addition to your regular high power snatches maybe on day one, and this with a little lighter weight on day two, when the day comes where they can't pull or make the power snatch jump as high because it's got heavier, they're going to be ready to ride into the full snatch this way. So, Mike, if you incorporate these where they're blending the, the power snatch and the overhead squat, that eventually when they need it, it'll be there for them. It's there. Yeah, it's absolutely there. You're, you're you know, maybe on those heavier days, well, I'm going to put in some recommendations to talk about training here at the end, Danny, on how to put that together. But this movement right here would certainly get them to understand how to handle the weight, how to control it, tighten it, and ride it down. It would prepare them very well for that. And similar, power clean. So we're catching it high, power clean, and then she's riding down into a front squat. Not only will this prepare your athletes to do a full clean, but again, talk about time efficiency. <laughs> you basically have done a clean and a front squat. So, you know, if you had time for 45 minutes in the weight room and you want to get on the field because 
we hardly ever get sunny days in Chicago in the spring. And you got a day where you want to get out and throw before it snows the next day. An exercise like this is a tremendous exercise to put in. So in this, in these particular exercises, Mike, you're probably doing, you know, moderate weight, just working on the rhythm. That's it. We're going to, and I, I have some recommendations here coming up in a second, Danny. We'll talk about sets and reps and everything. Okay. So, but transitioning from the power snatch to the full snatch, we go overhead squat and we go power snatch to overhead squat. You're putting them together without a long stop in the middle. They catch, they tighten, they ride into the full squat. Same thing on the clean. They know how to front squat. They can do it well. They can do it comfortably. We do the power clean. We don't change the pull. We don't change any of our positions. We make the bar jump as high as we can. We catch it, and we ride down into the front squat. Got it. Ballet. Ballet with a barbell. Gymnastics with the barbell, like the Russians used to say. <laughs> um, don't be that guy. This is another reason why you want to teach your athletes to do it. Say you're not going to snatch. Let's say you're a power cleaner and you're like, get Tony and Tonka me in the snatching. The power clean is an endemic exercise. It's, it's all over America, okay? It's, it's a bread and butter sports performance exercise. And yet, we don't teach athletes how to catch a weight when it's too heavy for them to catch above parallel. So what happens? Starfish, they become a starfish, okay? They become Patrick from, from SpongeBob. And if you have seen your kids on max out day get into these kind of positions, you know what I'm talking about. Again, if you understand the mechanics, the, um, what happens when somebody blows out an ACL, for example, it's that valgus position under load of the knee. Look at this young man on the right. His knees are going in into that valgus position. And at the same time, his lower back is being pushed into a hyperextension, okay? Same thing with this young man on the left. Look at his right knee coming in past a neutral into a position where you're just starting to go, oh, my God, it looks painful to see, okay? This is what happens when we start moving towards max out day on power clean, right? We all know it. We look in the mirror. We know it. This is what happens, okay? So how can we help this not happen by teaching the athletes to do full cleans. Power clean, go into a front squat without stopping. You know what's gonna happen after you do that for a while? Their clean numbers are gonna go through this, the roof and their confidence and their throwing ability is gonna go through the roof. I taught every high school football player that came through my strength and conditioning program how to do power clean into front squat. And when we got into our max periods where we were maxing, had 12 kids over 300 pounds, all doing a good full clean, trying to make it jump as high as it can, catch it and ride it down. As you saw with Lasha, even with over 500 pounds, that's what a weightlifter does. Not this, that. <laughs> yeah, you know, Mike, the, the obvious thing here is you look at the legs, but if you look at the two lifters kind of on the upper body, the guy on the left has kind of got it semi-racked. Yeah. The guy on the right. It's horrible. You're right. Yeah. That that's pretty common for a high school weight room, which to go back to your point about using front squats as a kind of a developing exercise all along, that helps you position the weight correctly, you know, getting the bar rack cor correctly before you actually do the squat. The clean the clean makes the catch and the racking a kind of a one part motion, but at least you know where it's supposed to go. I don't think this guy's got a clue no, where it's supposed to go. No, you're right, Raj, 100%. You know, I, I, I actually think if you don't front squat to some extent, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use even power cleans just because of exactly what you're saying. I mean, the, if you are a strength coach or a throws coach who says, I'm power cleaning, even if I'm not going to ride below parallel, I think you got to front squat for exactly what you said, Raj. Um, this, the, pop, the front squat teaches you where to catch and hold a power clean in a good way and we talked also about core development and olympic lifting because you're right at least the guy on our left here has a bar in a pretty good rack position his spine is neutral okay this kid on the right man that's hyper extension you know let's say uh, your conference track meet is uh this is the beginning of conference track meet week 
and this is your best thrower. Well, you just hurt his back. Now he's not going to be able to uh, throw a shot for you. So what have, what have you done, you know? Yeah. But this starfish thing, is, it's endemic in strength and conditioning. And um, teaching athletes how to do a full clean takes it away. It takes away. It ups the athlete's confidence exponentially. Hey, uh, a question from the uh, attendees uh, on uh, overhead squats. Yeah. We, do you have a suggestion for um, how to help uh, load overhead squats when a uh, uh, gym may not have a rack? Yeah, good question. That's why I kind of think you should organize your overhead squat based on how much somebody can power snatch. So maybe if a gym doesn't have a rack, one thing you could do would be one power snatch, stabilize the weight, and then do your overhead squats. So the two would go together. That's a self-regulating way to get some kid to keep from going too heavy. So, you know, if they can snatch, you know, again, 110 pounds, they, they power, or power snatch it, they power snatch it, they stabilize, and then they do the overhead squats. Um, another way to do it, it, even this without a rack is, is very hard, uh, while it's impossible, would be, you know, to have the bar behind your neck with your snatch grip and drive it up with your legs mm -hmm. and do your overhead squats. So you possibly could have two partners hold the barbell up and the kid kind of gets down behind it, you know, like a, like a back squat. But I would say if you don't have a rack, you got you to gotta power snatch it first and then do your overhead squats. And, and you, you may not go back to the high pulls anymore, but as, uh, as a part of strength development to improve cleans and snatches, yeah. will, will you speak to later uh, how you might use the high pulls for both lifts and how you might program them? Yeah, I don't necessarily have it in here, Raj, but let, let's, let's talk about that one during the wrap up here when I give some programming suggestions. Okay. Because that's a, that's a, a really good one. Um, what, just in general, though, let's think about the purpose of a pull, okay? We talked about the snatch or clean being a very objective power or strength speed measurement for us as a throws coach, okay? It's very objective. Power clean went up year over year over year. Good. I'm doing a good job on that aspect of developing the thrower, okay? If the pull is not so much an objective measure, you know, why do I need to do it? Well, the reason you need to do it is because it helps strengthen, first of all, some weaker parts of the movement, you know, um, and it helps, it can help develop that feel, that ability to punch against the floor, that development of force against the floor. It's just that you lose the ballistic part of throwing it and the triple flexion part of catching it. But I would program in, I think very simply for a throws coach, let's say a day you power clean, you're working up to three sets of three at a certain weight. When they're finished, you put 10 more pounds on the bar or 20 more pounds on the bar and do three more sets of three of clean pulls, okay? So I would use it as an adjunct exercise to the snatch or the clean, it's definitely not a substitute. It's something you would do more in strength phases because it's done slower than the snatch or the clean. And as we're peaking and getting ready for competition, we wanna to start to take out exercises that aren't as applicable and pulls aren't as applicable because they're not as explosive as a full lift. You lose the ballistic part where you actually throw. So something I put in early phases and I would just, really stress to any coach that's going to use pulls really be technically fussy and make your pulls the same as your lifts you know you don't want to develop i remember um this example comes from throwing uh reading in bondarchuk or one of the soviet throws articles one of the soviet writers that um throwing you know obviously we throw heavy shots as part of training but if you get a ball that's too heavy for the person's strength, they change their technique to throw that ball. Thus, they're not really developing their ability as a shot putter, right? Because mm -hmm. the right. technique is so different. So the same thing in a snatch or a clean pull, Raj. If you make it so heavy 
that it's so slow and so different than your snatch or a clean, it's not really applicable to the snatch or the clean. Okay. The, the, the guy on the right reminded me there was another couple of questions. It, it, it's pretty clear he's got uh, what I would call running shoes on. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, and maybe this is a point for coaches more so than anything. Uh, they don't tend to be too stable, you know, neither on the heels or side to side. Um, and and kind of what, what should coaches keep an eye out as lifters are squatting? That, that's an extreme position, so we won't talk about that. But relative to shoes rolling or, mm -hmm. or, or maybe not being so stable, is there – is there something that you might recommend high school kids use as an alternative to running shoes? Yeah. Weightlifting shoes would be preferable, of course, but. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be with you. That'd be my, my first thing I would say, Raj, if possible, let them get weightlifting shoes. I mean, um, kids buy throwing shoes, obviously, and, you know, hopefully your throwing shoes last a while. Uh, your weightlifting shoes, I guarantee you, if you take care of them, I mean, unless the kid grows a lot, I don't see why a pair of weightlifting shoes wouldn't last them all through high school. Um, you don't wear them outside, you know, you don't, you're just wearing them for the time on the platform. But when I worked for the Bulls, we had a cabinet full of <laughs> Adidas weightlifting shoes up to size 17. And when the guys got on the platform, we said, put your weightlifting shoes on. Um, that's something we talk a lot about in the level one in the bill, you know, in regards to stability and hitting positions better. They really do help with that. Short of weight, and you can get weightlifting shoes now for under a hundred dollars. So I mean, you know, again, not everybody can afford afford that, but you know, kids do talk their parents into shoes for sports that are much more expensive than ninety dollars. Um, and they don't last that long. So, and that's ninety dollars for a pair of shoes that'll last you your whole high school career. Right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no problem. You keep them in your locker, and when you come to strength training practice, you bring them with. And when you go out on the field to throw, you you swap them out. Short of that, uh, Rod, you hit the nail on the head. A running shoe is about the worst thing you can wear for doing Olympic lifts in because um, they have that high sole that tend to taper, you know, from the floor towards the the bed of the shoe and that has to do with you know letting your foot move and or cushioning the, move, the foot when you're running but you don't want that kind of cushion when you're catching a lift because no lateral stability it's like jumping your feet out you know standing on top of high heels <laughs> almost so um at the minimum you want a flat soled shoe um people have had decent success with like basketball chuck taylor type shoes um, basketball shoes. I've seen some cross trainers like from that people actually use in CrossFit classes that work pretty good for doing uh, power snatch and power clean in. But a special note, because I think you pointed out good here, Raj, when you're talking about weightlifting shoes, the point of this talk was to talk about doing full snatches or full cleans and having that little elevated heel will help an athlete sit lower with a more vertical torso. And that's really important for controlling the load over their head or on their shoulders. Um, you know, a lot of us lack ankle mobility. And even if you have fantastic ankle mobility, having that half inch, three quarter inch lift on your heel will really help you sit up taller as you go into these deeper squats. So. I would try to go for a lifting shoe first, and short of that, a nice flat-footed, strong, stable shoe. It should be tight on your foot. You know how kids, you know, come in with their shoes untied or <laughs> shoes they practically blown out? No way. They cannot wear those into the weight room, especially to an Olympic lift. Okay. All right. Good point. So let's do a few thoughts on programming here as we start to uh, close up. So when might be some times you may consider a full snatch or a full clean in your programming. First bullet point I thought about is a time of the season when your weight room time is short. So i.e. peaking. Um, consider the fact that you may lift more in a full snatch versus a power snatch. Well, what time of the season would you want to be lifting your most? Peaking. So um, during peaking times, for sure. 
Also, uh, since you catch a, a clean versus a power clean, you're basically doing a front squat attached to it. If I want to have more time out on the field and less time in the weight room, doing a full clean, maybe standing up and throwing a power jerk or a jerk on it, I'm doing full body development. I might do, you know, one upper body move and, hey, head, head out and start throwing. So uh, a full body, you know, movement like that where you're going into a below parallel position can really help when time is short. But just special note there, if, you know, don't say, well, Gatone said full snatch when you're peaking, but power snatch the rest of the year. You can't expect to just be good at it while you're peaking. If you are smart and you go, hey, when we get into our full max effort singles towards the end of the track season where I want them peaking in the weight room, then I want to prepare them early in the season. That's another reason when they come in at the beginning of the track season, do your overhead squats for fives, get their shoulders ready. On your light day, do power snatch plus overhead squats so they're ready to go into that deeper squat when they catch the heavier weight. Um, also, I just kind of referred to it during any type of normal training, this could be a great second sort of speed light day. Let's say you do heavy power cleans um, from the blocks on day one. Let's say you're power cleaning twice a week in your, your weightlifting program for throws. That wouldn't be that unusual. Let's say it's Monday and Friday. So on Monday, you do your you know three sets of three at your heaviest weight. And maybe on Friday, you take 10 pounds off that and do doubles, power clean, right into a front squat. So it'd be a good second day, almost kind of like a, dare I say, dynamic effort day, but a day where you could kind of work the body a little more athletically and kind of work on that rhythm and timing at the same time. Like I said, in peaking phases to maximize loads, lift it efficiently and safely. Star fishing is not safe, okay? But I'm in a peaking phase and I'm maxing out. I can't pull it as high, coach. I'm trying to get under it. I jump into a starfish and I lay back. No, we taught you how to catch a weight and ride down with it. So for peaking phase, important. One thing I want to talk about on reps, keep reps on Olympic lift variations low. Um, I would recommend five reps as a maximum number of reps for an Olympic lift. I would really stay more around threes. Um, funny analogy, I remember in high school, we uh, kept our shots in those big uh, five gallon buckets. I think a lot of schools do that. I remember carrying them out and uh, we thought it was real cool. We did a drill called the machine gun where one guy just, you stood for your stand throws and one guy just fired you the shots. You know, you grabbed it through, grabbed it through, grabbed it through. How do you think our form looked at the end of that? Like hell, right? <laughs> Same thing. I, so what did I learn? Technique like hell. Same thing if you're going to start pulling power cleans or cleans for eights and tens and twelves. You're practicing bad form, okay? So keep your repetitions low. It's a technical exercise, just like, you know, South African drill is. So it's technical. We want full, full power, full speed. That means lower reps. Always in Olympic lifting, stress quality over quantity. Olympic lifts aren't max effort failure type exercises. And if you use that type of loading in the weight room on a bench press or a squat, you know, I can, I can live with that and understand possibly why you do that, but not on an Olympic lift. They're not that kind of movements. You know, you, you're always stressing quality over quantity in a set. Okay. Summarizing here, um, I believe the Olympic lift variations are crucial tools for throwers. Olympic lifts, as we talked about, are the best tools for developing power and rate of force development and speed. They have a tremendously high transfer to training and lifts produce highest power outputs in sport. No other sport produces this four, five, six, uh, hundred, six thousand watts output that we see in Olympic lifting. They help protect against injury. Remember the, gym, the Russian gymnastic with a barbell? They promote mobility. They promote strength and stability. That make All those qualities make you less susceptible to being hurt. And also sounds like what you want in a good thrower. Mobility, strength, stability. I would recommend you uh, to really take some time to consider learning 
full Olympic lift variations. I mean, I, I gave you just kind of a, some, some rudimentary ways to progress from power snatch to full snatch and power clean to full clean. And like Danny said, even with the assumption that you already know how to power snatch or power clean, um, if you don't feel great in your knowledge, it's not rocket science. It's not, you know, curing COVID-19, but it takes a little bit of knowledge and, and it's worth it for you because having that knowledge will help your throwers move heavier weights and that helps them produce more power in a safe and efficient manner. So I would recommend finding somebody near you, um, going to a seminar but take some time to learn how to do the Olympic lifts better. Um, in that way, I would uh, tell you to please uh, check out our USA Weightlifting website. Uh, currently with the COVID-19 uh, quarantine, we are offering for the first time in history online level one and level two courses. Um, they're going tremendously well. You can look on our website. Here's a link here, um, but you could also just go on um, teamusa.org slash USA dash weightlifting and you'll see our coaching online course uh, schedule there and how to register. Um, I would really recommend you give yourself that uh, that ability to learn how to do these because it's going to put you at a level above the people you're competing with. I, I promise you that. Um, hey Mike, yep. uh, uh, there was a question uh, when Mary was uh, doing a webinar yep. uh, about um, content of level two. Yep. And she, she, she was uh, obviously strongly in favor of taking both level one and two, yep. but uh, can you talk a little bit to the programming aspects of the level two course? And, and then also maybe uh, contrast what programming in the level two course might be compared to, you know, what I'll characterize as uh, any number of weightlifting programs that might come from magazines or other internet sites that might be oriented to body, you know, body parts on given days and things like that. Could you could you give us a little of your insights there? Yeah, sure, Raj. Uh the level one course is learn how to lift. Pretty much that's the, that's the bread and butter. That's the emphasis of the level one. We teach participants how to do the snatch and clean and jerk and all the variations, power snatch, power clean, movements from the hang. It's very lift intensive. You're usually pretty sore after you do the level one in the hands-on fashion. And right now, because the level one, we know that it is, um, something that we typically push, uh, you know, th th that people get a lot out of from a hands-on perspective. If you do take online, you're eligible with the one price to go later on in the year to a hands-on one when they come, come around. But anyway, uh, level one is very much learn how to lift. That, that's what it is. And, and to teach you how to teach the lifts. Level two goes under the assumption that you know how to teach the lifts. Um, we do spend a lot of time in a more biomechanic analysis of, of understanding the lifts, um, watching technique and learning how to correct problems, errors. That's a big part of the level two. Exercise selection for um, developing various individuals is a part of the level two. And then, yeah, we go a lot deeper dive into programming. There's a tremendous lecture in there by Anna on periodization and kind of sports science as it relates to training programs. And then I follow that up with a um, training for intermediate and advanced weightlifter lecture. So um, we get more in depth into, okay, somebody knows how to do the movements. Now you want them to be able to do more on the movements. So that's what we uh, get into more on the level two. It's a lot less hands-on. Um so just a side comment, I'm, I'm waiting for Anna's book on, uh, as she, she was a former thrower and throws coach on yeah. uh, programming for throwers. I, I still haven't found that yet. Yeah. But um, how do you feel about it? And I, and I want to just jump, a, a, insert a few questions here that. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Before we get to the end. What, what do you, so I was always personally a big proponent of uh, 
overhead stuff from my better throwers. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm, I'm a proponent for throwers in general, but there's an element of safety and things yeah. like that. And I didn't always feel some of the younger lifters or the less proficient ones were so good with the overhead stuff. So I'd maybe keep it to cleans and power clean stuff like that. Yeah. But, but for those who might be good enough to do jerks, mm -hmm. would you uh, make a comment about uh, split jerks versus squat jerks and maybe contrast that even to push presses? Yeah. No, really, really great question, Raj. <laughs> Last night, I did a little private uh, Zoom webinar for some NFL strength coaches. Um, and I, I said to them, I'm like, look, as long as an athlete has the, the mobility, okay, that's why you're going to do something like an overhead squat or just a standing press first. You have to assure mobility. Um, they have that. There's no athlete that I don't think overhead explosive movements are good for. now. Like, here's the caveat. It's the coming down where there's problems sometimes. So first of all, if I decided to use power jerks or jerks um, in a strength and conditioning setting, and I would, um, I would either let the athletes do singles and drop the weights. So that way, otherwise, in other words, it'd be coupled with like a clean, right? Or I would hope to have like jerk blocks so they could drop each time because the the drive of the power jerk and the split jerk the impulse is exactly the same as that of the snatch and the clean we use our legs to make the bar jump in the air on its own so the torque on the shoulders that internal external rotation that we sometimes see in pressing be in front or behind it's not there on a power jerk or a jerk we drive it up with our legs and then we stabilize overhead and almost any physical therapist will be very much in favor of people doing loaded overhead carries with a stable arm. Well, that's what you do at the end of a power jerk or a jerk. You drive it up with your legs. So again, you get the power production part, but then you get the stability part added on. So I would, I'm a big proponent of overhead lifting for athletes, first of all. Um, but just like snatch and clean, there's progressions and there's a mobility component you have to show first to earn it. You don't just have everybody do it. Um, regards to split jerk versus power jerk, that's a very interesting question, Raj. Um, most people can lift more on a split jerk than a power jerk. So I think um, it may be worth your while if you intend to use it as an exercise where you really want to progressively overload and kind of objectively see how much can somebody lift year over year. Teaching them how to split jerk is probably a good idea because pretty soon at some point they're going to drive up loads that they can't lock out in a push press or a power jerk. So I definitely think teaching the split jerk is a good idea. Um, in regards to push press, I also love push presses. I think push presses are tremendous for shot putters, especially, um, you know, the dip with and drive with your legs up into your hands is pretty much what you do at the end of a, of a shot throw. I mean, I think it's integral for a shot putter to push press. I think it's probably more important than bench press actually. Um, but that said, Again, you have to prove that you have the mobility to do it. You have to develop the overhead stability with lighter, slower stuff like seated presses or just standing military press. But the issue of push press versus jerk is load. Um, if So a push press, I dip and I drive and I lock out my knees. That means I'm finishing with the muscles of my arms and my triceps. Um, or my shoulders and my triceps, which is good for upper body development. But at some point, I'm going to fail on the amount of weight I can drive up on a push press because my upper body isn't going to be strong enough. I'm, I'm not driving, able to drive it high enough with my legs to lock out with my elbows. So at some point, I have to lower my body to meet the weight. So push press is a great exercise. It's, it's, um, does, it lacks the speed and the power of the jerk. So, you know, as a peaking exercise, I may pick the jerk more 
or pu- or power jerk more than push press. Push press, I think, is great. Um, higher rep exercise, you can go up. I've gone as high as tens on push press. It's not easy, but I think it's really good for kids early in the season. So I I view it as more of a strength exercise, where I view power jerk and jerk as more of a, a strength speed exercise. Uh, it can live in the same. They can live in the same world, though, or same pro. Uh, um, sure program Raj you could push Absolutely. press maybe early in the week and then jerk or power jerk on your speed day towards the end of the week uh, J- Jim Aikens asked a question here about flexibility and I I, I thought he was going to ask when I'm going to pay off the bet I owe him well that that was that was worded in such a way as I couldn't relate it on this webinar okay. here. thank you um, but the uh, question of flexibility comes up a lot and in fact I can kind of kick myself because I find personally, again, the better my lifters get, the stronger they get, the more important flexibility becomes. They'll get tight in hips and shoulders. And if I remember correctly, you did a presentation at Wheat North a few years ago on this very thing. I think if we pulled up the video from that, that that probably would give us about an hour of what to do. But can you comment on that too? Might be, that might be our next one. That's so, fantastic. I, th- I, I think, you know, look, guys, um, I, I understand the time constraints and, and the, the issues that you run into as a high school coach, let's say, you know, and, and also the issues of the variety of athletes you get. You know, you get some studs who can put a bar over their head in an overhead squat, and then you get some kids who just no friggin' way, you know. So I, I know it's it's not easy to to, you know, deal with that massive – uh gene pool that you have to have to have but in in addition or as a precursor to even saying i'm gonna snatch or clean you know we want to look at any exercise that will help make somebody who's doing a sport a, a better functioning organism you know that's why you know way back in the day i remember when i first got interested in, in you know, in high school, you know, I knew in high school, I wanted to squat versus land a Nautilus machine leg press that we had in our weight room, you know, because just one doesn't require the stability, the mobility that the other one does. So the cool thing about an overhead squat, for example, or a front squat is they do prepare you for doing these lifts, but they, they connote and they develop that mobility. So to Jim, I would say, um, and this is what I said to these NFL guys last night, is from a general standpoint, knowing what I know about the mobility that we encounter with human beings today, in my warm-ups all the time, I would make sure I'm addressing ankle mobility because a lot of people, especially high school, or you know, in this case, we're talking about high school kids, lack that ability to keep their heel flat and have their knee go out over their toe. So you gotta develop ankle mobility. You gotta develop anterior hip mobility. There's a lot of kids, you know, they sit, they hunch forward, their hip flexors are tight as drums. So hip flexor mobility, and then stretching out the front shoulder, um, and also getting the upper back the upper spine the thoracic spine to move independently of the low back because you know these kids that they're standing there and you ask them to put their hands over their head and instead of extending at their upper back they have to lean backwards and their low back to be able to get their hands over their head so we can do a whole podcast on this if you want danny but i would say in general i would love it uh jimmy in general there's a lot of good stuff, and if you send me a side email, I can send you some stuff. But I would look at mobility exercises aimed especially at those areas, the ankle, the anterior hip, and the thoracic spine, or being able to um, flex, or excuse me, extend the thoracic spine independent of the lumbar spine. I think those three areas would go a really long way to getting kids to be able to rack a bar in the clean, and overhead squat much better. Hey, um, quick comment, Mike. About and I do hope I can pay you one of these days, Jim. 
<laughs> <laughs> Quick comment about um, uh, time between sets. Yeah. You, do you have a feel for... Uh, I do have a feel. Um, again, you know, you guys are dealing in a world, a strength and conditioning coach or a throws coach is dealing in a little bit of a different world than I am when I'm just training my Olympic lifters, right? I mean, um, my programs, the, the people I train, even the high school kids in, in weightlifting, they're in the weight room for two and two and a half hours a session. I know that's not as realistic for you guys, obviously, because, you know, you got to get on the field, you're doing your stair jumps, you're doing your sprints, you're doing all your other stuff that you do with your throwers. Um, I think you should keep their rest times under control. Um, in general, when athletes are lifting 90% or above, you can push those rest times to, I would say three minutes would probably, probably be plenty. If they're sitting longer than that, they're cooling off. And if they're sitting shorter than that with those heavier loads, then they're maybe not recovering fully. Early in the season, you know, I think you can superset a lot of stuff. And I think you can rest one minute. Let's say you're supersetting, I don't know, incline press and uh, a reverse lunge. That would be a good superset for a, a, a thrower, I think, a shot putter. You know, you do your incline, you rest one minute, you do your reverse lunge, you rest one minute, you do your incline. I mean, you know, people may say, well, even if you maybe you're not maximizing the strength, you know, recovery there, but you got high school kids in a weight room, you want to get some shape out of them and you want to, you know, you got to keep them moving. So, you know, I think anywhere from one minute to three minutes is your sweet spot rest times. Okay. The heavier, the longer. <laughs> yep. Yep. Hey, Mike, I got a question here uh, that was emailed in. Um, I think the Olympic lifts are great, but with a 13-week season, talking about high school track season, mm -hmm. it's difficult to spend the time needed to become proficient in the Olympic lifts. Yep. Um, wait. Um, what would you recommend I try to implement at a high school level with a lot of throwers in a 13-week season? Yeah. First thing I would say is don't train freshmen like seniors. I think um, you're, you have one or two really good years to do more development on the freshmen and sophomores. So, you know, you can spend – because I know you're spending more time teaching them just how to hold a shot and how to glide and everything – you know, you don't have to worry as much about the progressive resistance part of strength training for them. You can worry more about the technical part of strength training for them. So I would really be focusing on the movements that I want to load and progress and show, you know, tremendous ability on when they're uh, juniors and seniors. I would focus more on treating those in a very technical fashion as freshmen and sophomores. So that's first thing I would look at as a four year development, not 13 weeks, but four times 13 weeks, you know, and plus maybe you'll see them at other times of the year. That's one. Um, the second thing I do, I understand completely um, what you're talking about. You know, I think uh, something like uh, the progressive steps we teach in the USA level, W level one could be really helpful in a case like this. So you take one uh, aspect of the Olympic lift, say power clean from power position, and you do that for the first four weeks of the program, you know, in a really good focused fashion. So they look good at it. And then in the second four weeks, you go hang at knee. Same movement, hang at knee. Maybe the reps have come from fives to threes now. And then last four weeks, We've done some pulls from the floor. We've worked on their mobility. We know they can put the bar on the floor now. We take the bar down to the floor and we'll do doubles, you know, with our heaviest weight. So, you know, we spend, Bondarchuk talked about keeping the same group of exercises for four weeks. 
um, you know, whether that was throwing a certain weight hammer on a certain length chain or whatever those exercises were. And I would say the exact same thing in the weight room. So, you know, for freshmen, maybe you never progress below the knee. Maybe you just lift from power position for all 13 weeks. Maybe for sophomores, you only lift from the knees for 13 weeks. But by the time they're juniors and seniors, they should be pretty proficient enough where you could you could take it down to the floor. And would you have those freshmen be doing front squats also in their Oh, routine? God, yes. Yep. You know, there's a, a question that just came in that uh, uh, I'm sure you have an answer for, Mike, but it, it probably fits Dan better. If, you, if you've got a throwing program with 40 or more throwers, <laughs> how, do you, how do you manage your weight room time, especially when you're doing Olympic lifts? You beg someone <laughs> to, to, to volunteer their time like I have. I have a young man named Tony Bellini who's probably on here right now who has, has saved me. I mean, we have a ton of throwers. And because, first of all, I would say, if you're, if you're wondering whether or not it's worth it to put in the time that Mike is suggesting that you put in to develop your athletes, it absolutely is. And, the, you know, the hard part about that is in a chaotic weight room, your, kid, your kid's going to look over and see another kid starfishing a bunch of weight on a clean, and you're, gonna, you're asking them to do moderate loads to do a clean, into a front squat and they're just in the learning phase. Sometimes that's difficult and you've got to really, you know, coach them through that. But in the long run, they'll do much more weight when they're juniors, when they're seniors, once they master these movements. But there's no substitute for coaching them. You've, you know, you've got to find time to be on the platform with them. And yeah, if you've got 40, you got to go out and beg someone. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, whenever the, you're out with that person, do ne never let them pay for a beer. Yeah. Hey, you know, I guess, too, though, the, the, the issue you guys have, um, and I experienced this volunteering over at my local high school when my son was throwing, you know, yeah, it, it's the same thing on the field. I mean, I saw a really cool video that Jim Akins posted recently, and I loved it, a whole bunch of kids at once doing, you know, some kind of a release drill. Um, if you think about how you deal with a group of 40 kids on the field throwing shot, right, you have to do a bunch of group type drills and you have to do a lot of responding command. And I would say, I believe in Olympic lifting enough as a tool where I would really want to spend some time learning it, but I'd have a bunch of PVC pipes and I would have a bunch of empty bars and I would try, if I had 40 kids, I would have four groups of 10 and I would be doing responding command for my Olympic lifts, at least for the first several weeks before I let them kind of go and fill out their card on their own. So what does that mean? Like group A on the platform, snatch grip, power position, ready, hit, boom, everyone snatches, hold, back down, ready, hit. We can do, you know, our five sets of three that way and I can watch all 10 at once and make corrections as I need to, set the bar down, do your rest, or go do your, your front planks or your hamstring stretch or whatever, next group up, next group up. So, you know, I would think, I, I think approaching your Olympic lifts, at least for that first several weeks, in that, in that aspect of technique like that, as you do on the field, I think is, is really, really fruitful in the long run. I think Mike captured it perfectly. You've got a coach in the weight room the same way you do in the ring, on the football field, on the basketball court. You can't take kids in the weight room and ignore them and go, you know, write up football plays. Um, so it's work because you're coaching in the weight room just like you're coaching on the field, but it's absolutely worth it. The, the kids will, will be able to do these movements well. They love it when they get good at it. They'll be able to do more weight uh, safer, and it's – it's absolutely, it's really gratifying when you um, have a little bit of success with that. Cool. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do a few other points here, Raj, and if any more questions come up before we sign off. But so, yeah, so I would just recommend, try, try to take some time to learn how to do the lifts because your kids are going to benefit by lifting more weight safely. Um, 
of course, I tout the USAW level one course and level two course. Check out our website. One thing I uh, I gotta say, um, I as I, as you know, I come from throwing, um, and I know that some of the best, most explosive, strong men and women uh, in the high schools, in the colleges, and in the world are throwers, and um, you know. Mary uh, Thiessen Lappin spoke on here a couple weeks ago and in a very short time of coming over from track and field, Mary just damn near clean and jerked the American record uh, in a very short time of training. She turned a lot of heads that day. So uh, we do have a, a kind of a crossover recruiting program. I don't want to steal anybody's, uh, you know, big time throwers, but if you have somebody who wants to do something on the off season, or maybe just somebody who, you know, they've maxed out their collegiate career. They're not going to try to become a professional, but they love the weight room. They're a strong person. Send them to us, you know. Send them, send them to me on Instagram or, or Facebook. Or uh, this is an email for our director of recruiting, Sanchez at usaweightlifting.org. Um, any, any of those places, uh, I'd love to hear from those kids because, um, you know, I know what it's like uh, to finish your your four years of of college or high school and still have a competitive itch, and you're kind of a a bigger, explosive person who loved the weight room, um, but you know you're just not a you know you're just not a 70 meter you know female hammer thrower, and so there's really not much left for you to to do after high school or after college or whatever, and uh, you know. If you're that per girl who was turning over 250, 60, 70, 80 pounds on a power clean, I got a sport for you. So <laughs> give, us a, give us a call there. You know, some of the – my high school hero, uh, the re reason I really fell in love with all of this and one of the rings was Al Furbach. Al, if you're out there, thank you. Um, and Al Furbach was a national champion in weightlifting and track and field. Um, you know, in the same year, the, the two sports go together tremendously. I, I would even consider it if you live in an area where there's a good weightlifting coach, you know, and the kid is only throwing, let them go work with the weightlifting coach in the off season. They're going to come back to you a much better thrower. Um, and I, I told uh, Danny a couple of years ago at the, in Lyle at Benedictine at the big throws meet, I was, you know, just worshiping at the feet of Art Venegas, who was one of my heroes uh, for years. And, uh, you know, I was telling him what I do in weightlifting now. And he, he literally, he shocked me by saying he, he wished that, or he would have wanted to see what would happen if Godina had taken a year and really pushed his Olympic lifts up. So it was a hell of a statement when the guy was, you know, the, one of the greatest throwers in, you know, in the world, or not the greatest thrower, he was world champion. And, you know, his coach was still saying, I would like to see what happened if he cleaned more. So the two go together. Take your time, learn how to do the technique, learn how to teach it well. And in the long run, it's really going to benefit you. Here's my contact information, uh, my email. It's mike.gatone at usaweightlifting.org. I'm pretty active on Instagram, too. That's uh, mgatone64. And just wrap up again by thanking uh, – McThrows, thanks, Danny. Thanks, Roger. You guys are great. And I just really want to thank my colleague, uh, Anna Swisher, uh, for <laughs> letting me take all this great material she wrote. Thank you, JP Nicoletta. And thank you, uh, USA Weightlifting Coaching Education. So that's it for me. Any more questions or anything, I'll be, be glad to take them. Roger, how are we doing on the questions? We're all set. We're, we got them all. Just want to tell everybody that uh, this presentation will be on YouTube in a couple days. So check with mcthrows.com. I'll uh, post a notification then. If you're a college strength coach and you're looking for CEUs through your association, email me, Dan McQuaid. The, my uh, email address will be on the Zoom invite that you got. And uh, I got to send you a quick quiz and then um, a certificate. Um, stay tuned. You know, again, keep checking mcthrows.com. Next week, we've got Coach Joe Frontier from the Madison Throws Club. He's going to talk about finding the right technical model for your thrower. And we'll have um, more webinars to come. Hang in there, everybody. This is a difficult time for all of us. But I'm hoping that, you know, by doing these at least a couple hours a week, we can forget about life and, and just talk with a bunch of other meatheads and, and get better and become better coaches. Coach uh, Gatone, thank you. Fantastic job.
You're welcome, guys. Thanks for having me. Go throw far. All right. Appreciate you guys. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.